Hello everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining and welcome to this GFOI webinar on biomass monitoring. It's great that although these are challenging times, we can still connect online to the GFOI community. We had more than 200 people registering, so it's also great to see so much interest in this topic. And we're delighted to be convening this webinar covering biomass monitoring from space data, which is currently very topical, as you will hear from our speakers. I'm also pleased to say that we have a very distinguished set of speakers who will talk on this topic shortly. I won't take up time to introduce the speakers now, as they will do this themselves in their presentations. So this way we can maximize time for discussion. As you will see from the agenda, this discussion will take place after the presentations, so in about 45 minutes. And we encourage you to type your questions about the presentations and this topic in the Q&A box. This is not the chat. Um, in the chat, you can post any technical issues, for example. So please post your questions as we go along during the presentations so that we can address them with the panel afterwards. In the Q&A box, you can also prioritize other people's questions by pressing the like button. So without further, any further ado, we will start the presentations. Over to the first speaker. Hello also from my side. I'm Martin Harold. I'm from Wagen University. I'm also the coordinator of the GFOI R&D component. Welcome you to this webinar about a very interesting and involving topic on the use of biomass uh, density maps for national estimation and reporting. It's an evolving field, both in terms of research, uh, available data, but also in terms of increasing guidance to countries and also to address some of the needs of countries. And so the idea is this webinar to get everybody up to speed and show a bit where this field is going, what is the latest, and to create some room for further development, collaboration, partnerships, to, for everyone basically, to benefit from this new data source that is becoming available. I would like to start by explaining what biomass density maps are. They are essentially wall-to-wall -wall predictions of biomass for woody plants and trees. So we're talking about above ground biomass, we're talking about woody biomass, and we're talking about pixel scale. So in this map that you can see here, it's a 100 by 100 meter, so hectare scale estimation of above ground biomass that's available in this case for the whole globe. Besides these biomass density maps, which is basically distribution, also uh, see that products are being generated that produce these maps for multiple dates. So here's an example of uh, biomass density maps at 100 meter resolution for 2010, 17, 18, and if there's sufficient consistency between these times, you can also use that to then uh, allow for estimation of biomass change potentially. Um, we also have products that are directly providing estimates of biomass gains and losses. Um, they're often done by combining different data sources, um, remote sensing data sources, and actually show you directly on where biomass is being lost and biomass is being gained. Uh, so these products are becoming available. I think the production of biomass maps, single date biomass maps is quite established now. We see several products already being produced. Also research has evolved there quite a bit in terms of producing multi-date consistent biomass maps and these biomass change maps. I think this is at the moment very much a research field, but also quite an evolving field. And uh, so they are, also these products are becoming available more and more in the, uh, in the near future. Um, uh, this is driven by, you know, an active field of research. We have, we will hear more about that, dedicated satellite missions uh, that are really, their main objective is to provide improved biomass estimation from space. We have these efforts to produce these updated products and maps. Um, we also have active research to think about, to improve the quality of these maps, but also to think about and develop approaches on how these information can integrate with national level estimation and reporting. For example, think about statistical approaches, how to do that, how to use available national data sources in combination with these biomass maps to improve that estimation. There are also important investments in the validation of these products, so defining some community consensus guidance on the calibration and validation of these space-based biomass maps, and also investing in accuracy analysis. And I think many of the maps that are being produ produced actually have a proper map product validation uh, and uncertainty analysis that should help the user to understand 
what are the potentials and the limitations. So if you look at here, the, uh, for example, the SSCCI biomass map for 2010, 17, and 18, 100 meter resolution, if you compare that to a large global, global plot database, and there's a whole procedure on how you uh, compare plots to maps, uh, you can see that there's, on the global level, good agreement between uh, both estimates um, for the lower biomass ranges, so up to 150, 200 tons of biomass, then we start to see more variability, and we in particular see an, an underestimation of biomass in these maps for high biomass ranges. Huh? So above 250, 300 tons of biomass, there's a, so there is a bit of a sensitivity problem. That's that effect that we see in most of the maps. Uh, there's a lack of sensitivity of sensors. I mean, also this uh, issue is, um, is being worked on, uh, but in general, sensitivity is lower there. Uh, and you can also see, if you look at these um, plot to map comparisons over multiple points in time, there's also quite some consistency in these uh, relationships between plots and maps you know, which increasingly says, well, we are, we are getting more confident in uh, in the value of these products uh, in terms of their, their prime consistent quality biomass information. So the national level uh, uh, estimation, um, how can it be useful? In general, biomass density maps uh, are relevant for many environmental and policy applications. There's quite a long list. We're talking here about national greenhouse gas estimation and reporting, and there, I mean, the obvious uh, uh, use is to assess carbon stocks and emission factors to produce emission estimates. Uh, in particular, for example, with countries which have large inaccessible pieces of forest, which have uh, areas that are undersampled and stuff like that, using these spatial biomass prediction can actually help to increase the quality uh, of estimation in those regions. You can integrate. Uh, the biomass map with uh, activity data uh, to produce wall-to-wall uh, -wall estimations uh, and eventually also direct estimation of biomass change, for example, in the sense of tier three methods. Uh, you can use these maps as an independent source, for example, for verification and comparison purposes, or it actually is a, is a good way to provide a bit more spatial explicit information with your Greenhouse Gas Inventory. We know that's increasingly important when we want to make the greenhouse gas inventory more policy relevant and showing the distribution of biomass, showing the distributions of where are, my, where are the main areas of biomass loss, the main areas of biomass gain is often very policy relevant to, for example, target implementation, maybe to find poli poli policies and think about uh, how to track uh, progress uh, on certain developments over, over time. And particularly this enhanced transparency framework, the UNFCCC, there is an there's a need to create more consistency also between policy and, and greenhouse gas inventories. I think the spatially explicit information can be quite helpful also for these purposes. In the IPCC good practice guidelines for AFALU, which is the, the, the baseline, the base uh, document for national estimation and reporting for greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases, the 2019 update had a, uh, a new section on the use of biomass density maps. This uh, section has been further elaborated on in the new GFI methods and guidance documents. So there is some uh, evolving guidance available now to countries on how these maps could be useful in these guidance documents. But of course, we know the difference. Uh, what you see here is uh, two maps. One shows, and that's based on the FAO Forest Resources Assessment 2020. You can show how many NFIs or National Forest Inventory data points countries have. Um, you see that in the tropical world, first of all, there's many countries do have some kind of an inven inventory. Uh, there's been a lot of improvements over the last years. Huh? There's a lot of new, lots of new inventories have been available in tropical countries now to improve their national reporting. But a lot of them are actually one date or only partial and of NFIs, uh, whereas you see, for example, in, you know, Northern, uh, North America, Europe and other parts, we see that NFIs uh, it was quite a common way of regular rep rep reporting. Uh, but if you see then also uh, the most recent data points, you see that quite some new tropical inventories are becoming available. But the point I would like to make here is there's quite some variability yeah, in terms of what NFI data countries have available when this the last data point is, is provided. And based on that and based on the characteristics, there is not, let's say, one way these biomass maps could actually be useful uh, for all the countries. I think it's a very country specific context and need that need to be considered here. For example, the definitions 
forests and biomass can be different. What is the availability and reliability of field data, for example, to integrate space-based and field-based biomass estimations? Um, what is the country actually needing uh, in terms of the biomass map? Is it just more as a, for verification purposes? Already, I'd like to have more spatialized my greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, I really need to provide better estimates and understand better areas. So that determines a lot on how this integration can, can be done. The uncertainties, understanding the uncertainties, I guess for both in the plot and the map data is an important consideration. And of course, integrating with national level processes always has to have some kind of a long-term perspective. So I would say a one-time research product is not so useful. Uh, maybe it's useful maybe to test things, but I think really it has to be a long-term perspective to also allow comparability, consistency, and sustainability over time. And I think that's also where the value is with these space-based data that will be that are available regularly, uh, also in the longer, longer, longer term. The question how the long-term sustainability of some of these national efforts can be supported um, from these space-based data in combination with the field data the country is collecting as well. About um, what, how these estimation of biomass can be done. This is taken from the methods and guidance document, the third version. Um, basically, the estimates from space-based information can be used as reference or as auxiliary data. Uh, so it's basically one is to prove the estimates itself. Uh, so they are, they are the, if you use them as reference data or auxiliary data to enhance and improve the, uh, the precision of the est est estimate. So basically these maps can be used as a source of auxiliary data uh, for increasing precisions for the estimates um, and uh, in providing maps and ground-based data are available. Uh, it can be used as a reference data to directly estimate biomass and biomass change. Um, <clears throat> if there is enough confidence that the quality of the map is good enough uh, for national and local scale appli application. So usually uh, there is a requirement to have some sort of higher quality data on the local and the national level available to assess how the space-based biomass estimates can help. Um, it can help to facilitate the estimation of emissions by combining these biomass density maps with activity data. Uh, and there is several ways on how that can be done. Uh, and then to localize emission and removal estimates. So at the end, you try to work towards more spatially explicit tracking of emissions and, re and removals, which is then more what people would call tier three models. Um, and again, there is um, several ways on how this can be done. I would say giving the context, how several countries are in, uh, I think it's more these uh, points one and two. Uh, now I think we can start to think and have approaches ready by the projects three and four. I think it's it's they're still very much in the in the research domain. So then, also like to start to close this presentation. So what are then in summary some of the considerations for using these biomass mapping in countries? Well, it's good to be aware that there's quite some progress in global biomass mapping, both from sensors in terms of product generation and in terms of validation. Um, there's so far few practical experiences with countries. We know some of that later in this webinar, but in general, we hear there's quite a bit of interest, um, but this need for developing partnerships between these biomass mapping experts and country experts to see how we can one work together uh, to take advantage of these new data source also for country I think that's going to be one of the key things uh, and next steps in this in this whole field. Um, the importance here, of course, is to consider the country context. So just the biomass map itself will probably not be so useful. So I think the need to understand what are the requirements, what gaps should be filled, and how can joint learning be achieved will be an important part and will have to be an important part of the process. And I would say that with space-based data improving over time, there is in particular the, the value of these approaches to think about long-term sustainability also. Uh, we know that sometimes national forest monitoring is, uh, is struggling to keep up the monitoring system over long term and there that's where space-based data that will be continuously available uh, can help also to provide a bit more of a long-term perspective. With that I would like to close with my introductory talk to get everybody a bit into the mood on where we stand and I would like to now pass on to the next presentations if you have questions there will be the question and answer session and later where you can raise your point or you can of course contact me or us if you have further things you want to discuss thank you
A cordial welcome to everybody. I'm Frank Martin Seifert, working for the European Space Agency at its Earth Observation Center in Frascati. I'm as well ESA's lead for the Global Forest Observation Initiative, GFOI. Today I want to introduce you to space-based data for biomass mapping. Despite the actual COVID-19 pandemic, climate change remains doubtlessly the biggest challenge for mankind in this century. Five years ago, politicians recognized this finally and agreed at the UNFCCC Conference of Parties in Paris, the so-called Paris Agreement. It came to into force one year later. Parties have agreed to commit to nationally determined contributions, reducing their future greenhouse gas emissions to hold global warming well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels and aiming to limit it to 1.5 degrees. But what does that mean for Earth observation and biomass in particular? The related articles are on national determined contributions, conserve and enhance sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases, transparency framework and greenhouse gas reporting, and last but not least, the global stock take, an assessment of collective progress. The first global stock take will take place in 2023, and from there on every five years. Thus, policy is demanding not just a single assessment, but the dynamic of carbon stock. Related to biomass, we are lucky. As we were entering now into a golden age of biomass missions. ALOS 2 and SAOCOM, both Albansar, are already in orbit. ALOS 2 is part of the long Japanese history on airband missions, and SAOCOM from Argentina, where its second unit was launched on 30th August this year. ISAT 2 and JEDI, both LIDAR missions from NASA, are in orbit since 2019. The other missions are still to be launched, most in 2022 or 23, like NISA, an L and S band mission from NASA and ISRO. ESA's Earth Explorer Biomass, which will be the first p band star in space, and JAXA's LIDAR, MOLI, and ALOS-4, whereas TANDEM-L is still a Phase A study from DLR. And for those who like to get the timeline, you see them all listed here, with their launch dates and their expected lifetime. It's an impressive view. And as I said, we are in a golden age of biomass missions. This graph shows the synergy observations uh, amongst the different missions. NISA, like other polar orbiting missions with a global coverage, similar missions are ALOS and SAOCOM. Biomass, also a polar orbiting mission, but with restrictions to the tropical belt and East Eurasia coverage. And finally, all the sensors uh, on the International Space Station, like JEDI and MOLI. Related to this rich resources, CEOS launched the CEOS Biomass Protocol for validation, which is a good practice guide to biomass model calibration and product validation at a global or near global scale. It guides map producers and users. It provides guidance to collect reference data and to use them for independent biomass product validation. Based on this, the author's team advocates for a biomass ground reference network to make the data from space missions even more valuable. The protocol is now out for public review. Many biomass maps on global and large scale were published during the last decade, mainly as single maps from Saatchi, Bocini to Abitabile on pantropical level, and Globe Biomass and CCI Biomass on global level. The map, what you see here on 2017, was released last year and the data is available on the CCI Open Data Portal. CCI Biomass is now the first one to release consistent global datasets over various epochs. An updated version of the map of 2017 will be released together with the 2018 and the 2010 maps. You will hear more about it in the other talks. So, let me finalize with the outlook. We have entered into a golden age of dedicated missions for biomass estimation. 
it provides a large variety, which includes star sensors of different wavelengths and lidars with different measurement principles. This variety has a need for calibration and intercomparison and provides opportunity for cross calibration of sensors. In situ data, which I refer to as the other biomass mission, makes investment in space more valuable. And with the biomass protocol, we have the guidance for it to improve the accuracy. Finally, this called for international cooperation and coordinated effort, because no one can do it alone. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Eli Peneva Reed. I work as a carbon science coordinator at the World Bank Climate Change Group. In the past few months, I have been engaged in this project together with Andres Espejo, led by the World Bank and supported by a consulting firm, Focusto Consortium GMV Innovative Solutions. And today I'll be presenting the findings of the analytical report with focus on assessment of innovative technologies and their readiness for remote sensing based estimation and forest carbon stocks and dynamics. I will talk about why there is a need to look for innovative technologies and will present the project objective. Then I'll walk you through the findings of the analytical report with focus on readiness of innovative technologies in the fields of remote sensing, geostatistics, artificial intelligence, and cloud computing by identifying the barriers and the enablers in each one of them. What you see on the slide is a representation of where we are currently and where we would like to be in the MRV process. As you know, traditionally, greenhouse gas emissions and removals are estimated by combining activity data and emission factors. Emission factor development is expensive, time-consuming, and necessitates a wide degree of expertise. Countries use these data to report results in a monitoring report that is subject to independent verification, which will serve as a basis for using and issuing credits and making the payments by the World Bank Climate Land Use Funds. But the use of these new technologies and methods could enable a reduction of cost for national and subnational wide surveys and would reduce the MRV cycle substantially, something like three to six months or less. That leads me to the objective of this project. Given the complexities and uncertainties of monitoring forests above ground carbon stocks and dynamics with current methods, this project will focus on analyzing the readiness of these innovative technologies. The World Bank is the best player to leverage its convening power to launch a discussion among stakeholders of the readiness of novel technologies to disrupt the way forest monitoring is currently conducted. This will be done through a twofold objective. First, assess and discuss readiness of novel technologies, and second, define a roadmap for implementing the novel approaches including both technical and policy recommendations. The analytical report defines what readiness means, evaluates whether these technologies meet the readiness criteria, and if not, identifies a comprehensive list of barriers which prevent their readiness and point to strategies or enablers to overcome these barriers. In the case when the identified technologies meet the readiness criteria, a roadmap for implementing the novel approaches outlining technical and policy recommendations will be defined. The methods to establish the technological readiness include three components, literature review for identifying innovative technologies and selecting relevant documentation. Two, data analysis for selecting the most prominent innovative technologies using key performance indicators in remote sensing, artificial intelligence, geostatistics, and cloud computing. This presentation will not cover policy. And three, identifying the technological gaps and limitations and providing recommendations for a roadmap. The next slides will present the findings with focus on the barriers, enablers, and general conclusions within each of the area of innovative technologies starting with remote sensing. The three main barriers identified are data availability of useful satellites, even though there are such technologies, for example, LiDAR and SAR, they're more experimental than operational at this point, and currently there's no guarantee of data availability, while others, such as PLANET, 
with high resolution optical data are rather expensive. Two, calibration data. In most cases, with exception of LiDAR, there is a need for field data to be collected for calibration, not just for validation processes. And three, error, or so to speak, the presence of noise rather than signal in biomass change results. Here on the right, you see two possible enablers. One, capacity building. Such activities have achieved a significant human and physical capacity in many of the Red Plus countries, so that they are able to analyze remote sensing data directly. And two, the access to free and easily accessible data. There is an abundance of free and open data, such as Sentinel data, Landsat data for historical coverage, as well as LiDAR that are available. So, conclusions. Accurate and consistent data on above ground biomass densities remain limited at regional to global scales. The high errors of these data sets make delivering reliable estimates of change practically impossible. Two, only by leveraging combinations of Earth observation data, such as LiDAR, SAR, and optical, will be able to generate above ground biomass data with sufficient accuracies and with a high resolution temporal and spatial scale to fully contribute to the MRV process. Three, this will likely include non-traditional LiDAR data, ground-based UAVs to generate accurate above-ground biomass data for calibration and validation. Geostatistics. The barriers associated with geostatistics include the computational burden, a low to medium level of automation, a lack of accessible training modules, limited software that implements cutting-edge methods, although this is changing. There are few applications for decision-making when considering uncertainty methods and a lack of well-established equations for estimating biomass and carbon. However, enabling geostatistics easier access to the appropriate data, increasing synergy with machine learning, along with advances in cloud computing and increasing availability of open source software. So, Conclusions. The main conclusion is that the geospatial methods are overall well developed and established in the above ground biomass estimation context, and such methods can be combined with and or be improved by machine learning. Other important conclusions include promising innovative technologies that are already maturing. Artificial intelligence. Barriers associated with implementing artificial intelligence include sometimes heavy data requirements, specifically for deep neural networks, the need for multidisciplinary knowledge, teams with expertise in MRV, remote sensing, artificial intelligence, and the need for standardization and methods. Tools have been developed without artificial intelligence techniques that now must be adjusted. These may well require high amounts of computational power. There is a need to have standardized algorithms for MRV applications. Much of current artificial intelligence building and training are human dependent and specialized for certain areas and applications. Enabling artificial intelligence are going, ongoing capacity building activities. Although there is a need to upskill MRV personnel to artificial intelligence, there is a free, easy access to high quality data. The relation of remote sensing and MRV should be understood by artificial intelligence groups and their tool and software development. Conclusions. Artificial intelligence cross-field area that it's cutting could impact strongly computational requirements, affecting cloud computing, global processing. Two, artificial intelligence barriers are related to the data barrier, such as MRV data points limited or the cross-field barrier, multidisciplinary experts, and the standard error, data cubes, what features, what type of outputs. Three, other artificial intelligence criteria such as ethics and the robustness of algorithms that are not directly related to MRV would need to be considered. Cloud computing. Cloud computing barriers include the complexity and diversity of data and applications that must be encoded and processed in cloud environment. Migrating data to the cloud can be challenging and certain necessary data may have privacy issues. Another potential barrier is the technical skill required to integrate diverse data, algorithms and applications within the cloud platform. And finally, the cost of purchasing and using cloud storage facilities 
can be high and or uncertain. Enabling the use of cloud computing is the relatively mature cloud infrastructure and platform services. Some remote sensing data are already integrated to the cloud platform and cloud migration strategies used by other disciplines could be adopted. Conclusions. One, cloud computing is a mature and versatile technology with high readiness for disrupting the MRV process. Two, there's barriers in terms of privacy issues, data storage, and data migration. Three, due to the global scale of the above ground biomass, cost can potentially become a barrier. Nevertheless, there are ways to optimize resources. What's coming next? For us, next steps are the organization of a virtual international workshop of experts, during which invited experts from the four fields of expertise that I just presented to you, remote sensing, geostatistics, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, as well as policy will be discussed. A position paper will be written to serve as a catalyst for finding best ways to apply the selected approaches and a roadmap for implementing remote sensing based estimation of carbon stocks dynamics and data management at the appropriate scales. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone. My name is Aristides Mohate, and I work for the National Fund for Sustainable Development at the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. I am currently coordinating the MRV unit for RED since 2016. Today I'm going to speak about the, the, our experience in monitoring deforestation and forest degradation through the use of radar data. This is part of the lessons that we had from the SMFM project uh, in Mozambique. So just to start, for the first time in the history, we have the updated information on annual deforestation, as you can see on the graph that it shows here. Well, another development in, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, science in forest sector related to estimation of biomass are the development of regression models that started in 2001 and still going on a lot of research related to uh, development of regression models. The idea here is to try the maximum as possible, reduce uncertainties and the estimation of uh, biomass and health uh, research and, and practitioners have the accurate estimation of biomass and Miombo forest and other type of forest. As you also can see, most of development uh, happens to be in Miombo forest, but also we have uh, work and uh, in Mopane and uh, and also in Mekrusi forests and. Um, we still have a lot of work to do to improve our estimation as our forest has, has got a lot of uh, variability in terms of composition and structure. Well, um, oh, where, where we, we are in terms of strategic and uh, uh, terms. Mozambique has approved the National Red Strategy in 2016 and uh, currently is implementing the first result-based mechanism uh, to reduce deforestation in Zambezia province, uh, which aims to generate uh, 10 million tons of, of emission reductions in five years. So with these two, two events happening, uh, the country requires to have a, a, a robust M and MRV system that allows to, uh, uh, to monitor annually the events of deforestation and forest degradation. So that's where comes the first uh, support we had with the World Bank and that uh, with the technical implementation from the LTS, uh, they funded the project to produce um, four so four important tools. 
one of which is the is the, uh, the, the deforestation and degradation maps that I'm going to show to you. And and uh, and this project uh, uh, benefited Mozambique and Zambia. Uh, the tool I want to show is uh, with the, uh, is, uh, is aims to uh, uh, get estimation of deforestation and forest degradation. And I'm not going to be very thorough in terms of uh, technical aspects. One thing that I have to say is that we tested this in two districts in Zambezia province, uh, one of which is Gile, another is Pebane. We produced a, a deforestation. We produce a deforestation map, and we try to get a feel of the estimation of areas. But well, this is the first map you can see in the in the uh, in the screen is the product developed by this tool and uh, provided us the the first estimation of deforestation using the biota tool and alos pulsar data we were able to generate this map which shows you three uh, type of three classes one of which is forest another non-forest and deforestation and then we have another map here uh, on the back where you can see is the map that we was produced using collect earth tools that helped us to to use as a as a reference map to to validate all the deforestation maps uh, on that uh, on the first map i showed you i just showed you and then the result of this shows, for example, deforestation events here. We could identify points of true events of deforestation uh, by combining the two maps, and which you can see on the table in the blue and the blue circles. And um, also, we could understand that there were some forms false deforestation event, which means that the reference uh, data couldn't confirm deforestation where the, 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 the map uh, produced uh, showed that there was actually have, had deforestation. So uh, we tried to combine, combining all the points from the reference maps into the, into the, into the other map and we, we could find that most of the points uh, 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 um, go, goes to forest, non-forest, but when you go to when you go to deforestation, only of 20 or 87 points, only 21 points are within deforestation and uh, de deforestation. So the other point that the, the, the map produced with Beyota shows that there is deforestation. There are actually other you land other land use. So it it the, the good thing is that we didn't find any omission errors during this test, uh, which uh, uh, help us to 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 come to a conclusion that uh, well this tool helps and could help and could help a lot uh, in terms of detecting where deforestation happened at the point but what is going on well uh, after doing this test uh, we became excited because uh, we thought that probably that would be that would be the 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 the, the 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 way uh, to 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 do our work, but we faced uh, one big challenge or limitation was that uh, the JAXA couldn't provide in in the time we wanted the mosaics uh, to to use and process and generate the estimation. That was a big uh, a constraint because they say that 
it take long um uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and we cannot wait as we have to do annual reporting we should have the mosaics already available uh to use but it is not happening and we still have we have to wait one year and after the, after one year uh, release then we have another time to process the date so it takes long and it doesn't go along with our reporting period the second is that uh, well we could get the image from from jaxa but it costs money and uh, at this stage we are not in the position to buy images from JAXA. So, and uh, another constraint is that uh, um, images uh, need a lot of work in processing and the skills required to process uh, radar data is, uh, is, 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 is not available at this stage in uh, uh, at the MRV unit in Mozambique. And the second, the, the fourth thing is that uh, we, we understood as well that the satellite performs best in the dry season. And, um, but this is not a, a big limitation. If we can have uh, data of the, the mosaics available, it's, it's possible to, and uh, uh, it's possible to do, and, and we have the capacity to process the data is possible to. To, to overcome this situation. And the, the last uh, limitation or challenge is that uh, the errors when you do the estimation of biomass and on the ground data and the allometrics and uh, the fact it has on the back st uh, st backscatter intensity values, it's also something that we, we, we acknowledge that challenge. And, uh, we have some opportunities that could overcome those challenges. One of which is that Mozambique is currently uh, establishing a process to, is currently doing the permanent sample plot that could be used to calibrate all these estimations that to, of biomass uh, with the right radar. And, uh, and we believe that could contribute significantly to reduce the uncertainties on the estimation from this data. And the continuing development of uh, allometric equations also could help us uh, and to reduce all the uncertainties on the, uh, associated with the biomass estimate. One of the good news is that uh, we had the National Forest Inventory and we tested the uh, average uh, above ground biomass from, from the four, for the four different forest strata and showed that all of them are below the 150 megagram per, per hectare, which is also uh, shows the potential of uh, use uh, radar data to monitor the forest in Mozambique. Well, although it has a potential, we have to be aware that in some parts could be a problem. Uh, if you want to quantify the biomass, you have to look at uh, some parcels could have uh, more than 150 megagram per hectare, and uh, it's not, but it's not more than 10 percent in overall. And we have to be aware that in semi evergreen forests like and in these areas painted uh, as you can see on this uh, yellow circles are uh, the areas where you mostly might have saturation when you are doing uh, moni annual monitoring using uh, uh, radar data well the more opportunities we see is that uh, probably in 2022 a new satellite comes up and uh, the idea is to have a free available data. Uh, I don't know, but that is what we, 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 we hear. And uh, we hope also that we can uh, access the platform the way we are currently access other platform to get optical data. And uh, I think that is, uh, that will be a big step forward if we, if we have uh, this development.
also we hope that uh, uh, this next year we put a more effort in the, in the, in, the, uh, in researching more on the degradation producing uh, annual biomass maps with the tool we have and uh, we need to we, we understand that we need to improve and from the in, on the in, the in the first stage we're going to uh, work with uh, um, uh, with the Zambezia province which is the area of interest now so this is uh, basically what I want to introduce and to show to you Mozambique if you are interested to know more about the MRP unit, you can see uh, in our, our web page is a www.fnds.gov.mz slash MRV. And this is my, these are my email contacts. You can contact with me uh, and my team. We will be more than happy to, to meet you and to have more discussions about the progress. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, first of all, thank you to all the speakers for some very interesting presentations. Um, and thanks to the attendees who have posted some questions in the Q&A box. We've already answered a few in the chat. Um, but there are some remaining. So I'd like to begin with a question from Destin Lokenga, who is asking a question to Aristides Muhate from Mozambique, who we've just heard from. Um, and the question is, does Mozambique have an operational definition of forest degradation? So perhaps Aristides, you'd like to answer that one now. Okay, I will answer through uh, audio. Yes, currently we don't have a clear definition of forest degradation. And I think it's something that we need to, 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 to do in the, in the following years, trying to solidify, to put more solid the, 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 the definition of forest degradation. I, th I think that also depends on how are we going to monitor degradation to have a, a, a definition of degradation? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to hand over to Martin. Uh, would you like to field the next question, Martin? Yeah, thank you. To so be going uh, a bit back and forth, and also from my side, thanks everyone for the interesting presentation. Um, I would like to also point out that the question and answer, you can still type questions. We will not be able to, of course, address all these questions here in uh, in the question and answer session. But we also people are also typing answers, eh? and you can already see there's some interesting conversations, links to references, other sources uh, that are available. I would also like to point out something that uh, was mentioned by Arke Rosenquist that uh, uh, the the CCI biomass uh, map that was presented in the presentation is based on, for example, these ALOS. Uh, largely based on these Anders Pulsar data, which also just were presented by, by RST as one of the main data sources in terms of the space based data. So that was very clear in terms of the, the presentation. I wanted to clarify that. Um, I would like to pick up on a question, uh, and you can upload questions, huh? um, is on the issue on is this information, that's now the top question basically, uh, is this information suitable uh, when using uh, for greenhouse gas stocks and estimation when using sampling approaches for area estimation? and uh, I can start maybe by answering, but then maybe also um, uh, Ellie uh, could also uh, uh, wave in uh, or others. Um, so basically, it really depends on on how, what way you would want to increase this biomass map data. I mean, for example, one of the obvious choices, and that was also what's coming out of these IPCC good practice guidelines, guidance is that you could use these biomass maps for improving emissions factor estimation. For example, covering areas that are undersampled in NFIs or other regions, for example. And so then in this case, you use the map to improve your emission factor estimation. Then your emission factor estimation can be combined with your activity data or your, let's say, activity data estimation, which in, in, in initially are two separate processes that we then can be combined in the accounting, so to say. So there is a way of, of, of doing that without. If, for example, you are more interested in moving towards these more 
wall to wall, so full coverage uh, estimation of emission and removals, which and I think that we also try to make that clear in the presentation is really a research topic at the moment. And it's not something that I think we that that is ready to be used by countries to go. But for that, uh, uh, a sample based approach for activity data might not be uh, so suited uh, for, for, for these kind of purposes. So the, the answer is a bit it depends. Somebody wants to add to that answer. Ellie, I was maybe thinking you, but fine also to continue. Let me, let me know. If not, then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take another question and then pass it back uh, to Sarah. Once uh, somebody, uh, Armando uh, uh, Alanis from the Mexican uh, Forestry Commission asked about the validation initiatives. Huh? So basically what we have presented today, mostly were these, let's say, large area global biomass maps. So global satellite data used to derive global biomass maps. So these maps there is a, usually a validation procedure that uses independent data fire quality to, to assess the quality of the data, but very much globally. Uh, it uses local and regional data sources, but it's very much a global assessment. Um, what is not done a lot uh, is really to uh, assess the quality of these maps for, let's say, for a specific country. And to do that, uh, I think it's very important to, um, to have a purpose in mind. Uh, and that's also what we wanted to present today is like you really have to think on the country scale how these biomass estimation from says can be helpful for national purposes. We showed several examples and based on that you can decide uh, how a best integration is possible. There are statistical approaches to integrate field-based, so plot-based biomass with space-based biomass estimation also for national estimation purposes. These methods do exist and I think that would be the way forward and I think there the purpose is not so much to let's say validate the global map, but to integrate the space-based biomass estimation for your own national purposes. I think that is the main objective, but that's what I understand, I think is the question here. I mean, there is, there are also these global validation efforts, and of course these global validation efforts also benefit a lot from local and regional expertise and local and regional data. So if somebody feels the interest to participate in these global validation exercises, that's also possible. And if you're, if you're interested, I would just uh, suggest send us a message and, 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 and we'll be able to, to, to get, get, get you connected into these processes. Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, there was another question about whether some of these data are available in Google Earth Engine and other platforms. And I think maybe this a discussion here more generally about the use of platforms and interfaces for data access, data processing. I don't know whether, Ali, you would like to make a comment on that. Hi, yes. So I, I want to get back to my presentation and just want to emphasize that this is a very much a beginning of something that we are hoping to become really innovative and uh, push us forward to reducing the time of reporting for the countries. And as I mentioned, uh, this is just an analytical report uh, produced by uh, the World Bank and um, uh, GMB. Uh, looking forward to this upcoming um, webinar, I mean, workshop and international meeting of experts. And that's exactly what we're trying to get. Some of you on this call uh, are going to participate in this meeting, exactly trying to uh, gather the knowledge and expertise of the international community to move this forward. And as you saw, there's a lot of uh, barriers, but there are enablers and we'll try to exactly get the experts to see what could be done from technological point of view and then from policy point of view of further implementation. Okay, great. So yeah, hopefully more things coming which will support use of the, these data, um, processing, access, and so on. Um, yeah. yeah, Martin, I see there's a question that you'd like to answer live. Yeah, so there is, um, there was also this question, could radar images delivered by Sentinel won't be a replacement for JAXA's images? Um, I think that's very much a question and uh, we did have uh, Frank Martin on the line, not sure if uh, he's ready to answer a question at the moment, but I can uh, try to give a bit of an answer there. So. There's multiple space-based sensors that can be suitable uh, for biomass estimation from space. Huh? That there is not just one. I think a lot of the experience and examples we have today are based on these ALOS 
pulsar data, these are long wave radar data. They are available since many years and have provided a lot of useful information. In addition, we have Sentinel-1 from, uh, from the European Space Agency. It's also radar data sets. It's a shorter uh, uh, radar wavelength. It's a bit less sensitive to biomass directly, but it's also used um, in biomass estimation pr procedures. So I would say they are not necessarily it's a one or, but it's, I think the value is in the combination. And there are also other satellite missions. People might have heard about uh, JEDI. JEDI is a NASA uh, based uh, laser on the space station that's currently acquiring a lot of data, very, very useful for biomass estimation. And there will be other upcoming missions also in the radar domain of, for the next year. So in terms of the the space-based data support, I think Frank Martin made this point in his presentation quite clear, for the space-based data support of these kind of things, we're looking at a very, uh, a very good future, a very bright future. Uh, uh, that uh, the data will be of better quality and will be of higher sensitivity to bio, to bio, to bio, bio, biomass. I think that's that's very important to 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 realize here. And so it's it, it's more than one data source that actually serves the purpose. Okay, great. Would Frank Martin, if you would like to say something? Yeah, please? well, yes. uh, thanks, thanks, Martin. That was already a very good summary. Uh, uh, I would say this, uh, the, the data are complementary within uh, CCI biomass. We see that uh, something like two thirds of the information is coming from the L-band sensor, so ALOS, and uh, one third is coming from uh, the dense Sentinel-1 time series. Specifically, the, uh, that uh, Sentinel-1 provides a dense time series uh, is uh, quite an asset uh, related to uh, uh, its use within biomass uh, estimation and forest uh, observation in general. And uh, I would like to add as well on uh, one uh, point what Aristide was uh, pointing. Uh, yes, uh, uh, <clears throat> more and more uh, sensors will uh, uh, provide the data free and openly. And uh, the one nicer, which she mentioned, uh, will be amongst those, as it's done already uh, for the Landsat and the Sentinel, uh, Copernicus Sentinel time series. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think we're almost, well, we're already at our hour, so time is up. Martin, would you like to have a, a, cl a few closing remarks before we end the webinar? Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you for all the people that presented. Also, thank you for everybody that joined. I think the idea is was really to get everybody a bit up to speed on what on what this evolving field is very very is at at the moment. I mean, this global biomass mapping is not only for the purpose of greenhouse gas inventories. I mean, there's lots of other applications that are benefit from them, and I think we would like to make them useful for that purpose. I think that's a bit why we why we're talking here today. Uh, there's a lot of requests of people being interested in the slides in. The, in the webinar, in the recordings. So all of that will be online on the GFOI website. So the whole GFOI has a webinar series. So that, that's that's one, of, one of these ones is today. And all of them will be recorded and will also be available uh, as, a, as a resource to people. And then also the encouragement is to really uh, feel free to contact also the presenters more directly if you if you feel like that's that's helpful i'd also like to say this is just uh this is basically just a bit of a, a stock take on where we are um and uh i think this field is, is is active and i think it's good for everybody who's interested to stay tuned research is working on it the space agency is working on it countries as you see from mozambique are starting to think about it and i think in the combination of the the experts together with the country uh, expertise and the country knowledge. I think that's where we can really make forward, uh, make pro progress for improving national estimation using these new data sources. With that, back to you, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Martin. And again, thanks from my side for joining. And we hope to see you at the next event. Um, and as we said, please do keep in touch via email. So we close the webinar officially. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>